Hello and welcome. It's Alexa Linton here, your host for the Whole Horse Podcast. We're here to look at all the ways that the horse industry is changing before our very eyes in very cool, very amazing ways. And we're chatting with the people at the forefront of that change, the professionals, the trainers, the body workers, the researchers that are helping our lives with horses become better and better. Thanks for being here. I love that you're here and listening and learning. And if you ever have a guest that you want to suggest or a topic that you want to hear, just let me know. And I'd love to hear from you. Hi everyone, it's Alexa Linton here and you're here on the Whole Horse Podcast. And today on the podcast, I'm so excited to be welcoming back one of my favorite guests and someone that I have become uh, very good friends with over the past year or so, which has been a wonderful surprise and and event. Um, Sarah Sloty is here to, uh, to share some of her newer work with us. And I'm, I'm very, very stoked, Sarah, to, to learn more about this, not new avenue, but an extension and opening up of the work that you've already been doing. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Alexa, for having me. It's always a joy to chat with you. Alexa and I, for those of you who've heard us talk before, we tend to get really nerdy. <laughs> yeah. Super geeky. Super geeky. We can get into some stuff a, a, a fair bit. So um, my two dogs are here. So I've got Trigger here with me and I've got Tron, who's our new puppy. And she's been with us since April. Um, she's in the room as well, occupying herself with some bones. So if you start to hear some noise in the background, she's tossing bones to herself to keep mm-hmm. herself busy. And, so. and I might have kitten noise over here. So we'll yeah. see how that goes. <laughs> yes. Well, I think most of the audience is animal lovers. So I'm pretty sure we're good, Alexa. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. I, I really, uh, it's so interesting because I, w- I was telling Sarah that I started at the Whole Horse Apprenticeship and all of a sudden there's posts coming up and people sharing your videos with Dr. Stephen Peters and, and talking about equiscience. And I'm like, hold up. I've, I've had my head under a rock. Like what, you know, what is this stuff? So I, I finally got on the website today and started to have a, a little bit more of a look, but would love to hear kind of where, where you're at with your work with horses and particularly this, this part of things, um, how that's moving forward. Sure. So, um, <laughs> thank you for indulging my dog. He's just like, I love you, mom. <laughs> Um, so, so equiscience was cool because equiscience kind of evolved naturally out of the equisoma work. So, um, so we've been continuing teaching and training and uh, doing a number of modules this fall. Uh, and so far the work has been really powerful and the feedback from, from students has been really, just really great in terms of how this work has been deepening their own experience with their own selves and also with others and with horses specifically. And, and as you know, the the um, the Equisoma program, some of you already know about it. So it's about taking trauma principles, attachment principles, somatic principles, and bringing that into horse human relationships for professionals. And so it's really a place for um, people who want to take this into their work and be providers of that way of working. Uh, and so that would be the Equisoma training. But there's always been over the years, a number of people asking for um, how to apply this in their own Course, human relationships within their own worlds, right? And so I was thinking, gosh, it'd be really nice to make um, a more public facing offer, mm-hmm. offer, right? That is more than just a professional training program for folks, but is really more about like, kind of like the highlights of what we teach in Equisoma, plus some other cool goodies as well, but really for general public audience. So more for average horse owner who isn't necessarily a horse professional of some kind, but someone who's really wanting to improve their own situation with their own horse, really understand their relationship a bit better um, and, and see some improvements and changes there. And so um, Dr. Peters, as, as you know, um, has, is one of the co-authors of Evidence-Based Horsemanship with Martin Black. And uh, I forget how this happened. A few months ago, he started posting 
probably earlier this year, probably, he started posting some stuff around um, trauma and horses and doing some research into trauma treatment for humans. And he was starting to really get on that bandwagon. I'm like, ooh, 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 we need to talk because this is, you know, this is the intersection where I tend to live. And I was like, man, it'd be really cool if we did something together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he just recently put out a webinar, I think, in the last couple of days, I missed it, unfortunately, because I was busy preparing for teaching at the university the last two days. Um, and, uh, but he just had a webinar on understanding regulation, uh, motion regulation or nervous system regulation in horses and how to help horses in various contexts from that lens. And so he's been putting some stuff out continually with, with Martin Black. And I said, you know, there's some really cool opportunity for collaboration here for offering something that brings our material together. Um, Cause as you all know, doc, Dr. Steve Peters is um, sort of this really wonderful neurobiologically informed uh, academic who's got a really great uh, ability with horses as well. And so he's got a lot of really wonderful content around the neurobiology of horse brains and comparing horse brains and human brains, that sort of comparative morphology mm-hmm. stuff um, that I find is really fascinating. And so, and he also is known for his horse brain dissections and helping people understand what's going on from a neurobiological standpoint um, with horses and horse behavior. And I was like, man, we should get together because there's so many goodies that I think mm-hmm. horse owners uh, would really appreciate or horse lovers would really appreciate. And so we came up with Equiscience, which is uh, a bit of a, a throwback to Equisoma, which is about horse and body. And Equiscience is, we had to find a different name for it. And so it just sort of evolved that we picked Equiscience, which is interesting because I started off with Equispirit, which was more about the spiritual, emotional, you know, energetic components of being with horses. And so it's fun for me that I've got these three words. I might revive Equispirit at some point, but Mm -hmm. uh, for now, anyway, we've got Equisoma and now Equiscience, which is really exciting. So this collaboration um, will be starting uh, in November. So just in about a week, actually. So I think if I go to the first module here, um, first module is it's November 6th, November 6th. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, and that is coming up pretty quickly. Each module is roughly two and a half hours long. This is our first time offering it. We highly suspect it'll be longer in future, but this is going to be a taster. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we've got, uh, I think, seven modules planned, and uh, we're going to go through some pretty interesting content in each of these modules to help humans understand their horses better, their horse human relationships better. So we're gonna be going over some of the literature, but also some of just some practical pieces. Uh, And since my background is more in the experiential therapies world, um, bringing in some practices that participants can engage in Mm -hmm. to better support their own awareness of their own nervous system, attachment ruptures that happen between humans and horses, misattunements that happen between humans and horses, and, and how can we support the conditions for something different to emerge in that relationship? Um, and so this isn't going to be necessarily specifically horse training tips and techniques. This isn't necessarily going to be how do you apply tr- clicker training if that's your thing. Like it's although th- what we're teaching is a foundation upon which those things can occur. We will speak to that. We will speak to some of the practicalities. But this is less about how do you do what and when, and more about a noticing and a being that's different and honing your eye and your nervous system to what is actually happening at a deeper level. Um, and that sets a foundation for these other things, these techniquey things that we do after, right? And so for those of you who know about the humane hierarchy, there's something called arranging the antecedents before we get into techniquey things like when do you use negative reinforcement? When do you use positive? When do you use differential reinforcement? When do you do all these things? You know, And it's like, we're talking here about some of the foundational pieces with the the history, the neurophysiology, the attachment, the trauma layering, the all these things that create the setting within which we try to do these techniquey things. And it's like, sometimes those techniquey things fall flat. And it's like, well, why is that? So we're hoping to provide more of a foundation for people from which to do what it is that they're wanting to do. You know, And so really, really groundwork based stuff that we feel is kind of missing. You know, there's a lot of courses out there about how to do X, Y, and Z, and not a lot of this sort of base, sort of relational somatic processing piece. Mm. So we're really looking forward to it. 
Yeah. That's really neat. I mean, I being geeky as I am, <laughs> the thing that the first module is like they're dissecting a brain. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to this. <laughs> I was definitely like, Ooh, like, yeah. how do I get on this bus? Um, <laughs> I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, but you know, for no. me, I am, I am very curious as, as to what has been discovered, um, around, uh, diff- differing morphology in horses and humans. Is that something we can touch on today? Uh, we can a little bit. That's more Steve's area mm-hmm. than my area. So mm-hmm. this is why we're partnering because there's some bits he does really well and some bits I do really well. And we wanted to bring those bits together. Totally. So it might be fun to do an interview with the two of us at some point, or even just have Steve on your, on your, on your yeah. podcast, because that would be certainly interesting. But, you know, if I think back to what I do know, there's some things about horse brains and human brains that are quite distinct, you know, and, and one of the things is that there's, um, humans have a very, very well-developed uh, orbital prefrontal cortex. Yep. So we've got this really big thinking brain that we call it the thinking brain, but we have this really um, big part of the brain that horses have less of that. They have much, a much larger olfactory sort of nerve and olfactory bulb bulb at the front of the brain. So they're more connected to sensory, right? They're more connected to visual and smell and sight and, you know, and hearing and all these kinds of things, whereas we're this sort of logical thinking brain creature, you know, and so they don't have that. So they don't relate with logic and rationality in the same way that we do. And also, by the way, we have difficulty with that too, when our nervous systems are taking over, right? And so we can have, you know, imprints and trauma responses and nervous system patterning that can take over our ability to have rational thinking. So there's, there's going to be that similarity. Horses also have a much larger cerebellum than we do. And the cerebellum, I believe, is connected with movement and motion impulses. And, and so if the, a large chunk of the horse's brain is allocated towards movement you know it just speaks to what evolutionarily was speaking was more was more prevalent for each species right we developed a very different part of the brain than horses did you know and so so it's very interesting to sort of notice that from that perspective horses vision is also very different from ours you know they see their visual field is incredibly different what is the center of the eyes at the pupil the round thing in the middle yep the pupil yep the iris is the color, right? Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. So the pupil of a horse is quite different, right? We know it's a long, it's a long bar, right? And so the visual field of a horse is quite different too. And how they interpret vision is different, right? And all this will affect their experience of being in the world. Their visual field is a lot more narrow and, and clear within a narrow band, blurry up and above and mm-hmm. down below, you know? And so when they look at something, they really have to like adjust what they're seeing to be able to see on top of that, they have the monocular and binocular vision you know, and, and, and spots around their body where they don't see, you Mm -hmm. know, and so they've got a very complex sensory relationship with the world that is quite different from ours. Their, their color range is different from ours, right? So, so all these things create differences in terms of our ways of experiencing the world. Mm -hmm. And, and we want to get more into, you know, some of those differences, but also some of the similarities, because as you know, Alexa, one of the things I like to talk about is mammalian morphism. So what, what's of common mammalian form? What are the things that we all have in common? Because Mm -hmm. there is something really important about, Yes, we don't want to anthropomorphize, but if it's something that's across species, it's something that multiple species experience, is it anthropomorphizing or is it anthropocentric to think that we're anthropomorphizing, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think to myself, well, if it's mammaliomorphic, as in all mammals or many mammals experience this because we have the same deep inner structures of the brain, I think of Yakpunksep's work around that, right? The seeking system and the grief and the rage and all these different, you know, emotional pathways in the brain. If we all have those, you know, to claim one of us has something and the other one does not is interesting. Sure, we're going to experience it differently because of interspecies differences, right? And because I have a big prefrontal cortex and my, my horse has a big cerebellum, we're going to have different experiences of those pathways, but the pathways are there mm-hmm. and the emotions are there. And there's going to be a, an, an interaction between how those emotions are felt and how the body experiences the world and motor movements and interruptions in need meeting, you know, that are going to be similar across species. So we will be talking about that as well, because as we may have talked about before, trauma happens in horses and humans, 
addictions happen in horses and humans. The same neurochemicals get impacted in horses and humans and other species. You know, lots of different studies have demonstrated this. And so we're going to get really nerdy and geeky about some of this stuff, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we don't want it to be super heady. Some of the modules will be more heady than others, certainly, um, just by virtue of the content we're going to cover. But our aim is to make it really practical so mm -hmm. that you as a horse owner, yeah, okay, cool. We did this really awesome dissection and that was super needy and, and, and nerdy and geeky and fun. But now what? Like, mm -hmm. what? What does that mean for you as you're out there in the pasture or the paddock with your horse? Like, what is the practical takeaway from this really cool nerdy dissection that we just did? Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. we're really trying to bring it back around. So while we've got all these lovely goodies for people through the course of this offering, um, we really want to make it hands-on. So it's like, okay, you know, here's where we can go from here here are some things that might be helpful, you know, and then let's bring it back into an experiential experience. So as you're hearing this, what's happening, right? And that's the piece that I'm going to be bringing. So there's going to be a lot of theory that Steve brings, and then there's going to be some of the more experiential bits and pieces that I bring in around, okay, so how is that resonating? How is that landing? Let's see if we can notice these things play out in real time. So we're taking a head concept and actually embodying it and feeling it. Right. So we actually have that felt sense because that's where the learning comes in, the integration of the learning rather, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I had the chance to go on and I actually took some screenshots of your modules because I was like, ooh, there's some juicy stuff in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm all about screenshots lately. I'm working on my case study and it's just like all about screenshots. So I, I have an interesting question and it might, might come from a little bit left field, but um, yeah. I've been working with a, a mentor in one of the things that she's been studying is the trauma release exercises. So working Very, with vagal yes. tone and tremors and and yes, things like that. Work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, I've been finding it very, very helpful work, especially some of the very simple exercises around eye, um, eye movement to, you know, stretch and tonify the vagus nerve. I, I'm interested, I don't know if this is a part of things that you're bringing together, but um, there, there is a part of me that's very interested in whether um, there is a way to support our horses in increasing vagal tone. So I know there was some, some things like, you know, like eating can help and humming and toning social mm. engagement, but is there any other pieces that you've found that, that are really supportive? Um, I think many of our horses like us, um, within that polyvagal understanding, um, may have, you know, uh, challenges with particularly the ventral vagal branch and the creating health within that space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so one of the things that is interesting, right, in terms of waking up the vagus nerve, and we do this in somatic experiencing. So David Berselli's work is similar in some ways and divergent in other ways. And so there's, there's parallels and, and where, where ways where it separates. Um, and that's beyond sort of the scope of this conversation. But one of the things I think is fascinating is how are we working with the social engagement system to wake up the vagus, right? So you talked about that with eye movements and vocal toning, which we, we do that in somatic experiencing as well. There's a fair amount of, like I said, of overlap there. The, the, the how or the way it's done might be slightly different, but the intention might be similar. Um, and so, um, and some of the intentions are a bit different, right? Now, you know, evoking the psoas muscle to release tremors may or may not be accessing a trauma response, but it may be releasing a general stress response. Sometimes it's connected to a specific trauma response, sometimes not. Sometimes it's, you know, so it's one of those interesting things, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but when I think about, you know, what we do with humans, one of the things that we work with is working with the orienting response, which is allowing the eyes to move, allowing ourselves to orient to sound and working with different sounds, working with scent. And one of the things that's been super fascinating is as we start orienting to sensory, that can, again, because we're using the parts of our face that are involved in the social engagement system, that can start to wake up the ventral vagus, right? So orienting while the intention is to orient to neuroception of safety, danger, life threat, 
as we orient, if we detect that we're safe, then we soothe because the ventral vagus comes online, right? So how do we do that with horses? So one of the things I found really, really cool as a parallel is Rachel Dreisma's work over in um, the, the Netherlands, mm -hmm. who wrote that really fantastic book on um, uh, stress, calm, it was the calming signals book yep. anyway. Yep. Yeah. Um, which I recommend for all my, all my readers and my, and my, my students to kind of go through is to, is to read this book because it's, it's fascinating in terms of learning to hone the awareness of the nuances of state shifts in horses. Mm -hmm. And we teach that from an SE based perspective in Equisoma, but I love Rachel's work because it adds into the things we can track that adds into the things we can notice. Mm -hmm. And her most recent book is on scent tracking for horses. And so here's the parallel. So scent tracking for horses is a way to get horses using their natural or olfactory bulb in the brain, the, the olfactory nerve, which connects with the vagus. The vagus connects all the cranial nerves with the rest of the body, right? And so if we can wake up one of those cranial nerves, the theory is, is that we're going to start to see the ventral vagus start to tone and come back online and have more capacity for connection and presence and all these kinds of things at least so the theory goes, mm -hmm. right? Polyvagal theory is of course a theory. And so is not going to necessarily, there's going to be some bits and pieces that can be, you know, massaged over time. And certainly there have been some recent, um, pushback articles saying, oh, well, there's, you know, this, this is a myth and this has been debunked. And what about this? Um, for those of you who saw some of those recent articles, please go to the Polyvagal Institute website. Porges has written a response to some of that stuff um, where he does explain why some of those um, arguments are actually missing the point of what mm -hmm. he's saying. Um, and so while they're, they're interesting points to be considering, they're, they're not getting at the core of the theory. And so it's, it, you can't write off a theory if you're looking at a peripheral issue that, you know, may or may not be a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So not that those arguments are not valid, but he brings in a rebuttal that I think is really important. So I'm going to let you all who are interested in that, let, I'll let Poor just speak for himself. I'm not going to try to interpret that. Um, but this idea that if we connect with waking up different, um, waking up the vagus nerve through connection through sensory, then we can start to see aliveness kick back in. And that's a lot of the work we do in somatic experiencing with the orienting response. What Rachel's doing with horses is engaging the orienting response, right? Scent tracking is about orienting to sensory, following trails, mm -hmm. tracking, mm -hmm. becoming more aware and more present in the environment and connecting to something. And then that probably wakes up some dopamine pathways in terms of reward centers in the brain, right? And because you track something and then you find something and ooh, and there is something lovely there, right? And so so there's probably some dopamine stuff going on there and that's less my knowledge or awareness. And I'll, I might let Steve Peters talk about those bits and pieces because he's the brain guy. Um, but I'm aware of the connection between dopamine and reward centers. And so that's where I, I wonder about that. Um, but there's, there's this other piece around the scent and so many horses are shut down, mm -hmm. tuned out and depressed, and they're in a collapsed state or they're in a tuned out state where they're disconnected or dissociated. And some of that is through, you know, their experiences, right? Early weanings, being in pastures by themselves cells being in boxes all day in their stalls you know there's all these things where we encourage deprivation yep. you know by virtue of the environmental conditions that they're in and so that deprivation can result in a dulling of the senses and a shutting down of aliveness and then we start to see a dull horse and humans are not that different to be honest mm -hmm. it's a mammalian thing not just a horse thing right and so horses that i've encouraged people that i've, been, I've said hey you might want to look into rachel's scent tracking work, play around with that and come back to me and see what you find. Mm. Right. And what's been interesting is that the people that I've encouraged them to do that, they're showing similar responses in their horses to what we see in SE with people, you know, in terms of the waking up the vagus, the horse starts to reconnect with curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Curiosity gets shut down when the ventral vagus is not available. You know, there's more to it than this. Polyvagal theory is, is, is very, very specific to the role of the vagus. Obviously, there's more going on than just that. I've become known for being the polyvagal lady. It's not my only bag. It's not my only thing. But it is the lens through which I use stuff because it's the one I've, I've gotten exposed to a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Right? So it doesn't mean that there aren't other things playing out here, but if we look at it from that lens, from that lens's perspective, this is what we're seeing. And so, um, so horses starting to get curious again, starting to use their snout to be curious how many horses have been smacked on the nose because they're exploring with their lips, they're exploring with their teeth, you know, and they're doing it without any kind of meanness. They're just exploring and then whack, you know, no, don't do that. Right. And so there's all these apprehensive responses that start to kick in around these natural drives and yes we're humans and yes if we get bitten by a horse it's going to hurt more than say horse to horse perhaps and yes there's interspecies dynamics around boundaries and i get all that i'm just speaking to the impact of these things on horses you know if we reflexively smack a horse in the nose after it's trying to nibble at us with its teeth to kind of explore texture because it's curious how much of that is going to shut down that animal's natural curiosity? And then that coupled with all the other sorts of um, conditions that the animal is exposed to results in an animal that's shut down. And so the scent tracking, as you gave an example, the vocal toning, humming, in somatic experiencing, we use the voo sound, yeah, the voo, other yeah. sounds we use as well in SE. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that we use. There's other modalities too, but since we're on this topic, um, you know, there's these bits and pieces. So with a horse, we can't make a horse hum, you know, <laughs> like you can't, you can't get a horse to hum a tune. It's just not a thing. But what's interesting is that, um, I was working with an indigenous community and one of the elders was telling about, uh, how, um, they're singing to, a, there's a particular song in that culture that this woman learned to sing to her horse and it helped the horse find his aliveness again when he mm -hmm. was tired on the trail. And one of my other colleagues wrote a piece recently around singing while in the saddle and how that can support your own regulation, your own sense of connection mm -hmm. and how the horse responds through resonance to your state mm -hmm. and what starts to shift in the relationship there. So while maybe we can't get a horse to do voo, we certainly can explore what happens within our own resonance and the horse's experience of us. I think of going to like uh, a chanting workshop or going to a crystal bowl thing, you mm -hmm. know, you don't have to have the bowl on you to feel the vibration, right? It's physics. So, yeah. um, so the same with the, 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 the orienting response and the scent, it mm -hmm. starts to wake up, especially since they have such a large olfactory bulb. I mean, we don't have anything near that size. You know, and so it's a really almost like a fast track. What I'm seeing is a fast track into the Vegas, you know, is starting to get horses curious again, starting to find their aliveness, starting to find their agency by virtue of how they're orienting to scent. Wow. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear. So, so this is, it's not the first time I've heard of, of scent tracking in this way, because I think it, it's coming into the, the horse world in different, um, you know, rendition, shall we say, mm -hmm. this understanding, but what, for Rachel, and I should probably reach out to her and see if she'll do an interview, yes. um, but, but in your understanding of her work, how does she describe an exercise in scent tracking with horses? That's a good question. I'll let her answer that question. Yeah. I'm okay. not trained in her work, right? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I look for is commonalities and similarities and where do the connections happen? Yeah. I haven't done any scent tracking with my yeah. horse, yeah. right? But what I look for is going, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. That sounds a lot like what we do over here. I totally. wonder if you're going to have the same result when you do that as what we're seeing with humans. And yeah. sure enough, this is what we're seeing. So, so I'm, I'm going to let Rachel speak to yeah. what those kinds of activities look like. Cause I'm not trained in scent tracking, yeah. right? but the, but what I've heard people do, some people do is having different scent stations, mm -hmm. right? So this is one version of this where the horse gets to go from station to station to look for a particular thing. Right. And so it awakens the seeking response. If we think of Yak Punksep's work again, you know, there's that seeking thing. And then that seeking is part of, again, I'm using the olfactory. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm searching, I'm using my nose and I'm engaging with my world. And there's something that mobilizes in that. There's something really beautiful about that. So I would love to do 
her training. And we've talked mm-hmm. about this before. We've talked about collaborating and we've talked about, you know, when is she going to offer something so that I can go to it? And <laughs> so, you know, so we keep, we keep talking about these intersections and parallels. We're not quite there yet. Give us another year. And awesome. I'd well, be well, happy to chat a bit more about more direct experience with her work. I know, believe me, I'm getting that Mr. Burns sort of. <laughs> you know, we'll be, we'll be waited, waiting with bated breath and we'll do another one of these. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. It's been interesting because I've, uh, um, as you know, I've recently moved my horses and yeah. uh, the opportunity has presented itself to create a track system where I am in the new space. Um, and one of the things that I just intuitively want to do is, um, is I go out with the hay in the morning and I just like put it in like random places out, you know, over the, the several acres that they have. I've created two kind of oval tracks um to incorporate there's this big beautiful horse chestnut tree in the middle of the field Mm. and so it's been quite fun to kind of you know like put little little goodies out out on the track and and even in our our other place I would um I would actually cut some of the willow tree and I would I would throw that out in different spaces in in their field as you know, because it, number one, it is such a good anti-inflammatory and, and number two, they just love eating it. Yeah. And then of course, is that as a little bit of like a adventure in finding the willow and, you know, um, something for them to discover yeah. within their, you know, paddock space that was interesting. Right. Totally. And that yeah. creates like an environmental enrichment, right? So there's, yeah. there's something about the enrichment component of that and the scent tracking, I think adds a little bit more to it. It's almost yeah. like it bumps it up to another level. My totally. understanding of it anyway, is, is one it's done in relationship. So it's done in relationship with a handler, which is different from environmental enrichment where we might drop some little yeah. breadcrumbs around the yard and wait for them to find them, which is important. Don't get me wrong, but there's also this um, this relational process, I think that's mm. happening between the handler and the horse also that within this connected relationship of, Hey, let's go over here and let's follow this. And, and, and then, and, cause it's, it happens on a line. And so there's a connection there that's happening. And so my suspicion is that there's also the feature of the relational component yeah. of the scent tracking in the way that Rachel describes it, that also adds and enhances that awareness of that experience for the horse so it's beyond just environmental enrichment it's also this whole other this whole other thing which I think is like I said there's so much potential I know it's so juicy I get so I get so jazzed about this stuff because it all starts to come back around and intersect right like it's it's um and this is where I, I just get curious because I just notice connections and I go, oh, but this is like this. And then how is that happening? And what yeah. happens if you go play with that? You go off and do that. And because I'm not going to have the chance to for a while. So you go do it and you report back to me. And it's so fascinating what people are finding, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm like, man, it's reinforcing the theory, right? It's reinforcing the observation that, yeah, okay, this is actually a thing, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you saw the video. I posted a video a while back of of Raven and I was gonging. I, I had borrowed a friend's gongs. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'd actually muscle tested to see like what tonality she wanted. So there was f- three or four different size gongs that each mm-hmm. had different frequencies. Yeah. Um, and at the time, I, I, I you know, my motivation had been twofold. I'd been trying to work. Actually, I'd heard that but that parasites can sometimes respond. You know. Really uh right like okay. in a uh get out of the body way to um different frequencies oh, and neat. um raven okay. has had you know a history of of um parasite infestation and so i was very curious on that level what was very interesting to me is her intense focus on these sound frequencies so she would literally walk as i was gonging i'd have to back up yeah. because she was like in it right like wanting to be right right inside of the the sound and it makes me think into you know the the humming or you yeah. know the voo sounds the the effect of sound frequency which i don't think has been particularly well studied with horses at this point but i mean there's lots of great videos out there of horses engaging in sound you know um in different ways Uh, but yeah, I found it so interesting to watch, um, and her engagement more or less with different frequencies 
was quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I found as well, interestingly enough, and maybe it was just my imagination that her, her foot, her leg, her arthritis became um, less painful doing the, the sound work with her. Well, see, so that's really interesting because Poor just came out with something called the Safe and Sound Protocol, Mm -hmm. um, which has been used for individuals who have difficulty with like sensory processing and emotion regulation and social connection and that kind of stuff. Um, And it's it's not meant to be. um, So some some folks in the neurodivergent community, autistic community, have you know are really sensitive to therapies that make them be who they're not. Right. So for instance, ABA or applied behavior analysis is being decried as being the, you know, the latest conversion therapy. You know, we no longer use conversion therapy to get LGBTQ people to stop being LGBTQ, right? You know, because that's unethical and and this is just a baseline variation that's natural and normal, right? And so, and so the autistic community is starting to sort of push back now um, around the use of ABA. There's research showing ABA on autistic people is, is, is can create PTSD because they're having to like change who they are inherently, mm. as opposed mm. to let's make society more welcoming, you know, like as opposed to, you know, do this thing. So you're not bullied. That's really not a therapy. That's, that's, you know, we should be working on changing the, the conditions. Right. So, um, but what was interesting is, so it was, it has been used with the autistic community, but not also, it's also used with people with trauma and so on and so forth. And Porges's idea is that by working with particular um, sound frequencies and ways sound hit the middle ear, that there will be a recalibration of the vagus nerve. And it's a really interesting therapy. I did the training for it, but I don't offer it because of COVID and I don't see anybody in person anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so for me, it's um, not something I'm using actively, but I did do the training for it. And it's really fascinating because I've known people who have used it with their dogs and other animals. Mm. I've heard of people trying to use it with horses and I have yet to find somebody had said, I know if somebody is doing the safe and sound protocol with horses. And I'm like, you got to put me in touch with this person. Like I need to find out Mm. who this is. So if anyone is listening today and knows who this person is, please point them in my direction and have them contact me because I'm really curious to find out what the results have been, because it's kind of like what you're talking about with the sound frequency work is, is if somebody is using that safe and sound protocol on a non-human animal, again, noticing changes in other species. Mm-hmm. And I've heard of dogs. I've heard, I, I don't know if somebody's doing it with parrots, but I, I do know for sure dogs. And I, I, I have heard of somebody doing it with horses, but mm-hmm. again, do not know who, um, and also what the results were. But what's interesting is that we, there is minimal, like you said, minimal research on the sensory processing impacts for horses. Um, so there was, um, one or two studies done with cows and looking at what kinds of music cows like, um, and what music cows mm-hmm. don't like. And there was actually a little soundtrack, a little playlist listed of the, of the, the musics that cows like, and the ones that they don't like, uh, based on this research that I thought was really fun. Um, and, uh, I think they've done something similar with horses around what radio stations, you know, they find stressful and which ones are more calming. Um, and so there certainly is that, but that's still a step behind what you and I are talking about, right. In terms of, okay, well, how do we move from that to toning the vagus through sound? Like, can we jump, can we make that leap now? Yeah. You know, and then how do we, and how do we study that? I'm not sure how we would study that. Yeah. Um, So that's, that's one of the things they've also done some studies around scent. Um, now this is not the scent tracking, but looking at, um, I think there's at least one study that looks at, um, essential oils. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm and horses. Um, and I think, was it lavender or chamomile that the horses found had a settling effect and other scents did not. Mm-hmm. I forget what the research had said. So don't, please don't quote me on that. I'm yeah. going to see if I can find the study for you, but, um, I have it listed in my manuscript, which is still on hold because life continues to be, because life continues. <laughs> I well, literally, like, yeah. Being someone who has experience, you know, has, has, uh, re- re- relationships with a lot of different equine therapists, Mm. and have has experimented a little a little bit small amounts with essential oils i do know that it is um in general horses will pick their oils you know and you probably have seen that as well you know even by opening a bottle they'll go nope not that one nope and then oh love that one um and that some horses will even if they're really needing that 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 substance 
will even lick it off your hand, you know, yeah. essential oils are pretty potent stuff. Um, so I, I found that very, very interesting too, is there's this reconnection to, oh, I need that thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, which is, is really quite a beautiful, um, uh, yeah, it would be neat to have more research on that level to see kind of what, what changes. And, and I find going back to the piece around sound with Raven, it makes me really tune into uh, inflammation and the balance of the nervous system, right? right. Vagus right. nerve tone and the reduction of inflammation, yeah. right? And it, it, yeah, it gets my brain, my wheels spinning in terms of you know, all the things that are going on behind the scenes to actually create yeah. potentially a, a more um, functional, balanced environment in our horses. Yeah, well, this is it. Like we really want to hold those conditions for the nervous system to be different, right? And that's yeah. that's really the whole goal. Again, that humane hierarchy, ranging antecedents, it hasn't really looked at that traditionally, but it hints at that, right? It's, it's you know, it's more instrumental, but I look at it from this level. It's like, okay, but that's part of it too. You know, what is, what is, what in the environment or in the relational relationships, you know, um, in that horse's world are creating a neuroception of danger, safety, or life mm -hmm. threat you know, and are we arranging or, or um, helping those conditions to cue a different response in the horse's nervous system? Because one of the things that we know, of course, and we know this with humans too, is, you know, if you, if the nervous system is pinging off of something in the environment that's telling it it's in danger, and we're starting to notice escalating behaviors because the horse or the human or whatever starts to feel in danger, then to try to meet it there and go, okay, we need to fix this behavior because this behavior is a problem. When in reality, the behavior is sitting on a conditional issue, yep. then it's unethical really, in my view, to kind of try to tr try to fix the issue here let's, let's sort out the environmental concerns. Let's sort out the relational factors that are creating this in the first place. Let's not gaslight the animal and make it their problem. Let's arrange the antecedents to use the behavioral language. It's not my language, but you know, it's what people know, right? So let's, let's do that work. Let's set the conditions differently for a different result, mm. you know, and sometimes people will go, well, my horse should just learn how to tolerate stuff. And I go, who told you that? Yeah who told you that when you were a kid that you had to learn to just tolerate stuff? Like, you know, like, where is that patterning coming from that we expect that horses are supposed to respond perfectly to all conditions? It's like, they're nervous systems too. They're, you know, they're organisms too, right? They've got a certain amount that they can do and some have more capacity than others. And we can support that capacity by creating different conditions. You know, mm. and some people are like, well, no, that's me giving in. And that means that they, you know, they're not learning anything. And I'm like, okay, well, you're not hearing me. <laughs> like, like, I appreciate where you're coming from, but your insistence on that fact tells me that there's something else going on for you, yeah. right? There's another pattern playing out or another sequence playing out. That's not mine to step in about, but I'm encouraging you to be curious about what that's about for you. You know, that there's that much activation and insistence that this horse has to be obedient under all settings. And I go, what's that about? That's that's a separate thing. And again, this is another reason why we created the Equisoma training for professionals, but now also the Equiscience training for sort of average public training, more of like an offering, right? An educational offering for the general public mm -hmm. to be able to start to take some of this stuff and go, hmm, how can this work with me and my horse? How can I start to shift and pay attention to stuff that I'm not noticing right now? Mm -hmm. Right. And so this speaks to uh, the five domains model of animal welfare that came out a number of years ago. And when I first started teaching the model, there wasn't any emphasis on the human factors in the horse's welfare. It was really environmental, sound, temperature, you know, distress, you know, hunger, thirst, do they get to be with their friends, you know, that kind of stuff, which is all important. Don't get me wrong. Those are natural need meeting things. And that's, that's important. But um, one thing we kept saying in our trainings was, okay, but where's the human element? What's going on in the relational dynamic? What's going on at the level of attachment? What's going on in terms of trauma reenactments? What's going on in terms of, you know, the horse, the human's mishandling or the human's dysregulation? And how is that affecting the horse, right? The unresolved stuff in the human, how is that impacting the horse human space? Mm -hmm. um, and now back in 2020, 
um, there was an updated article about the five domains model looking at the human element in horse welfare. And I was super thrilled because I was like, yes, that's what we're talking about, right? If, we, if we're missing ourselves from the equation, then we're missing a big chunk of what we can actually control and shift. Mm -hmm. and so people... Um, we had this in the most recent model of Equisoma, where a number of people, you know, think that they're going to come and do a training and learn a whole bunch of techniques. And while there are techniques being taught, don't get me wrong, a lot of it is about people's own awareness of their own nervous systems, their own state shifts, their own attachment stuff, their own patterning, right? And over the course of the module, people start going, oh, <laughs> This isn't about a X, do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. This is, this is, oh, this is about what's coming up for me. And how do I interact in a phenomenological kind of way with my own internal experience? And on a deeper level, this isn't a head thing, you know, and that's invariably what happens in the courses I teach is people start to going, oh, <laughs> oops, it's down here. Right. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's where it is. It's down here. You know, we can be up here and we're safe up here, but it's like, oh yeah, this is a different layer of, of awareness and people are sinking into that and it's really neat to watch. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so my suspicion is that equiscience will be similar, um, in a different way. Um, but in a, hopefully in a, in a way that invites curiosity and invites people to want to take some next steps around what they're learning and, and take it deeper for themselves. So we're really thrilled. We're really excited about it. Oh, I can imagine. That's wonderful yeah. to be doing that work. And yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I think there's so much that comes. Um, it's that whole, like, when we know better, we do better. Right. And mm -hmm. there's so much that comes when we change the lens that we're viewing, you know, training, behavior, um, even, you know, I, I, as soon as you said, you used that example of, of someone who wanted their horse to figure it out and they should learn this. And, and even the lens that we start to create or, or, or to find around adaptability and what it means in a nervous system mm -hmm. to be adaptable and to, and to learn new things, right? Um, is so often contradictory to what many of us have been have been taught that the the conditions need to be for for learning, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is it. And then how many of us were taught that if we can't learn, we're a failure, and it's our issue. And in reality, we just might have needed something different in terms of support. You know, yeah. like you know that that little bit of extra support might have allowed us to have a different experience, and we might have been able to move into a different area of capacity with our own being. And then it's like, oh, you know, and then how am I passing that along? Well, I didn't get to have that. So you don't get to have it either. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> there's the wound. You know, like, <laughs> let, Let's see if we can work with that because that's, you know, that's an interesting place, right? And it's like, oh, just because that happened to you doesn't mean that that's healthy or adaptive or whatever, you know, a lot of us had to learn how to override, but is that actually getting us where we need to get, right? you know, and then as there's shame around needs and as there's shame around, you know, wanting what we need or having a need and how do we shut that down? And mm -hmm. it's, it's just become so fascinating to me, you know, about the, the psychodynamics of, of this, the somatics of this, the mm -hmm. relational attachment pieces to this. And so this really is a capacity thing. So it's even just more when we know better, we do better. It's also when we have more capacity, our experience shifts. So it's not even just the knowing, but yes, that helps. Like these frameworks can be super useful, even just from a, a heady intellectual sort of place. But there's also the, the holding of the shifting capacity and then feeling that be different. Mm -hmm. And you don't know it here. It's not a here thing. You know, I just, like I said, I just finished teaching another two days. I've been teaching a lot lately and it's like, oh, and that's lands. When people get it, it's like, oh no, it feels different inside of me. It's not a knowing like it's, sorry, it's not a knowledge, but it's a knowing, like it's a, it's an embodied thing. And it's hard to describe until you've felt it. It's like, whoa, okay, that's a shift. And it's not just because I'm thinking differently about something, although that can help, you know, mm -hmm. we inherently are, as our capacity grows, our capacity to be with the horse also grows, you know, and we're not so much about having to make it be a particular way. Now, sometimes we have goals and that's fine. And so there are going to be goals that need to be set. And some people have you know, um, objectives for what they want to do with their horses. And so this can set a foundation for that, 
that's not my area. I'm not in any particular discipline. That's not, we're going to see me go with it, but this is about setting the conditions so that when you do good into your training, it unfolds differently. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Yeah. And before we finish up today, Sarah, it, and it, this hour has gone very, very quickly. Yeah. I wanted to just touch in into, I mean, I went a little bit through the, your, your itinerary of your upcoming course. Is there any other pieces that you're really looking forward to sharing any, any um, gems that are in there that, that, that you want to share about today? Um. I, I'm looking most forward to collaborating with Peter for the first, mm -hmm. or um, Steve Peters for the first time, call him Peter, uh, Steve Peters for the first time, I'm really looking forward to this collaboration. It's something we've been playing back and forth about for months, and we've had a number of meetings about it so far. We're going to meet again on the weekend, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the material dovetails. And, and how the synergies are going to come together and what's going to sort of flow out of that synergy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the piece that excites me the most about it. Mm -hmm. There's all the bits and pieces I bring and the bits and pieces he brings. I'm excited to see what he brings that I don't know yet because there's always more for us to learn. And so I'm also excited about what are the bits and pieces that will fill in the gaps for me? What are some new angles or bits that I'm not seeing currently, you know, that I'm looking forward to expanding my own world around, you know, mm -hmm. so there's that, that I'm super stoked about, but I think it's going to be the collaboration. Cause I always like, like, you know, doing these podcasts with you, Alexa, I always get like, yay, it's Alexa. I can't wait to talk with Alexa again, <laughs> you know, and then there's going to be like these other collaborations too, you know, talking with all these different people, all these different podcasts that have been happening. It's just been so um, enriching and satisfying and fun to connect with folks who are seeing the same things and and having that awareness and going okay yeah you're seeing this too and this is really cool and so I think I'm excited about the synergy and what people will get from that synergy mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. love it I it sounds fabulous um and I would love to uh, have you share how, how do people learn about more about you learn more about, um, yeah. this, this course that's upcoming and future offerings? Cer certainly. So I'll start off with the website for Equiscience. So it's HTTPS colon slash slash equiscience.com. If you try to do www, I think it'll route it there anyway, but it is an HTTPS and not a www. And so uh, equiscience.com. So E-Q-U-U-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Um, and if you want to, if you're curious about the professional training program where you can take this material and use it with others, um, then I would invite you to check out equisoma.com. So E-Q-U-U-S-O-M-A dot com uh, and then there's of course my own personal website sarahschlote.com s-a-r-a-h-s-c-h-l-o-t-e.com and i'm just going to get steve peters's website um horses let's see if i can get that link here so dr steve peters's website for those of you who are curious about his work um, and uh, his writings and his other collaborations, such as the one that he has with uh, Dr. Martin, or sorry, Martin Black, uh, the, the well-known horseman. So if you go to horsebrainscience.info, uh, you'll get to see Steve mm -hmm. Peters' website. So uh, that one is a triple W, um, horsebrainscience.info. Uh, and then you can go and feel free to nerd out and geek out and join us if you can. November 6th, we still got some spaces left. So if you want to register now, um, go to equiscience.com and, and click to sign up and we will there will be an automated um, email that gets sent out. So check your spam folder of the email address you used in PayPal to pay for it. Um, that'll be where the in invitational email goes with the Zoom link and all the instructions. Uh, check your spam in case it doesn't make it to your inbox. If you don't manage to see that come, um, please contact us. We will be emailing all participants uh, and registrants shortly. We'll be sending a, a follow-up email very soon in case um, that original email didn't make it. We've heard of a few people who did not get it um, in spite of it being automated. So um, we will be getting that to folks. So Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Much yeah. appreciated. You've got me motivated to get this up and going before you guys begin, because it sounds like such a valuable offering for, for um, folks. And, um, and yeah, I'm, I know there's 
probably some in my audience are going, that sounds just right up my alley. So I hope you go and check it out. And yeah, as always, such a pleasure to thank you have these conversations with you. Thank mm-hmm. you. So mm-hmm. much fun. I'm looking forward to talking to you soon. And, and if you listen to this after the program has started, keep watch for future offerings and we'll be we'll be running rolling more out in 2022, I'm sure. Wonderful. And if you uh, are wanting the links, uh, I will put them all up at uh, www.wholehorse.ca under this episode, and you can check them out there. Thanks, everybody, for listening in today. Appreciate you being here and happy to be back and podcasting and sharing this amazing knowledge with you all. I'll talk to you again very soon. Bye for now.